Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Sue Gardner, Executive Director of the Wikimedia Foundation. The Wikimedia Foundation is a nonprofit organization committed to building a world in which every single human being can freely share in the sum of all knowledge. Wikimedia's flagship product, Wikipedia, has become the largest general reference work ever compiled in human history. Hundreds of thousands of volunteers have contributed more than 14 million encyclopedia articles in 250 languages, all of which can be freely shared and used for any purpose. It is consulted by more than 300 million people every month, making it the fifth most popular web property worldwide. Since her arrival at Wikimedia in 2007, Sue Gardner and team have introduced major initiatives focused on organizational maturity, long-term sustainability, and increased participation, reach, and quality of the Foundation's free knowledge product. And I'd like to thank you, Sue, for, for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Mark. So the Wikimedia Foundation is such an interesting place. It is such an interesting series of projects that, that you bring to bear. All the information is, is freely contributed. All the information is freely available. Can you talk a little bit about the evolution of the organization through its history and, and where we are today? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I'll start by talking a little bit about Wikipedia's origins because it's kind of an interesting story. Um, Jimmy Wales is the founder of Wikipedia. He was an options trader in Chicago who made enough money to retire and live fairly quietly in Clearwater in Florida. So when he moved to Florida, he just was playing around on the internet and starting a couple of different kinds of projects. And he wanted to build an encyclopedia because when he was a little kid, he was very reliant. He was homeschooled. So he read a lot of encyclopedias. He was very interested in them and he wanted to build one. So he wanted it to be online. So he started something called Newpedia. Have you heard of that? Yes. Yeah, okay. So he started Newpedia, which was originally going to be built in a fairly traditional model with peer review and academics right. and people who were sanctioned as authorities and they would, you know, articles would go through stages of approval and so forth. So he started with that and it failed immediately. It just didn't work at all because it was just such a slow process and they didn't create enough articles and it just didn't grow. So then he um, discovered the wiki, the notion of the wiki, and decided to build Wikipedia as an entity that would sort of do raw article creation, which would then get pushed into Newpedia, into the sort of authorized, approved version. And one of the things that, that uh, when Jimmy described this to me uh, earlier, he had said that one of the things that drove this was that he didn't have to fund all the infrastructure to create the uh, content. Yeah. So the idea of collaboration and, and the practical reality of, of not having to uh, develop huge amounts of funding initially just to create content that was that was out there was, was yeah no that's exactly right and the thing is nobody knew that that would work right I don't think even Jimmy thought uh, certainly Jimmy didn't think that people spontaneously would come together and create this encyclopedia and it would be a huge success nobody thought that would happen right so nobody actually I don't think believed that amateur content creation people working together to collaborate to create articles would actually result in a high quality encyclopedia so I think everybody was surprised when it actually did work but it did work and so here we are today with 14 million articles as you say and increasingly high quality better quality every day so that was where it started, was um, with Newpedia, which morphed into Wikipedia, which then became the central thing. Wikipedia developed, I think it probably really took off in about 03, maybe mm -hmm. 04. It started to really grow quickly, and there was a, there was a sort of critical mass of gravity, people coming and, and creating new projects um, and adding to Wikipedia. And then other projects started to develop out of that, so little ancillary pieces that didn't really belong in an encyclopedia but were interesting and were also capable of being created through mass collaboration. So Wiktionary came out of that. Um, Wiki Quotes, I think, came out of that as well. Um, and then eventually further offshoots like Wiki News developed as well, right. you know, which were, were sort of adjacent, kind of next to the encyclopedia, but again, not really part of the encyclopedia. Um, the two biggest and I think most interesting projects in addition to Wikipedia, Wikipedia is obviously massively the most popular, right. but the two other particularly interesting projects I think are MediaWiki, which is the wiki software, which is used by hundreds of companies and individuals and nonprofits around the world. It's just a wiki engine that anyone can use, they can modify, they can do what they want with it. And that's also at no cost. Yeah, that's right. And, and there's a broad community of volunteers that contributes to it and builds extensions and so forth. So it's a, it's a living, growing, changing, evolving mm. um, software engine. 
And then the other, the other property that's pretty interesting is Wikimedia Commons. Do you know that one? No, I don't. Commons is, is sort of invisible to most people, but what it is is an enormous repository. It's a database, a library, an archive of freely licensed images and multimedia files. So there's audio in it, there's video material, and there are tons of images, including illustrations, photographs, um, uh, graphics, and so forth. So they can be used not just on Wikipedia and the Wikimedia projects, but because they're freely licensed, they can be used anywhere. So, you know. So all the content is, is freely available. If, if, if I wanted to put up a website and use entirely content from any of your properties, and I guess properties is, is probably not the correct yeah, word, right? Yeah. Uh, but let's, let's use it for now. But, but any of that, it's, it's basically becomes something that I can very that's, easily used without paying a license fee? Yep, and that's very much part of the point, right? So the point is not just to create this fantastic encyclopedia that people everywhere in the world can read, but also to give them power beyond that, to let them share it, to let them modify it, to let them use it to create other works and spin it out. And that, that's very much the point. So not just can people use it for their own purposes, mm -hmm personally, individually. They can also use it in classrooms, they can use it um, in educational settings of all kinds, and they can also, I think importantly, use it in commercial endeavors as well. The Wikimedia Foundation um, wants to tap into the power of the market and the energy of the market where we can, and so we see all kinds of opportunity for businesses to use our material, which further disseminates it and is good for our mission. It gets the material out there for people, um, and people can make money from it. So in the history, you start off with an idea, it fails. You take a, you take a different take on that idea, mm -hmm. and it succeeds, actually succeeds beyond w anybody's wildest expectations. You build out an infrastructure, which then you itself make freely available to people, and then you use that infrastructure to create all these different uh, projects, but based on the same idea. It's, it's knowledge that people contribute, it's freely available, and uh, basically the barriers to entry are, are, as long as you can get on the internet, you can make a contribution. Yep, that's exactly right. I mean, our origins come out of the free software movement, the free culture movement, the free knowledge movement, and that's the important part. There are really two ways to think about the word free in mm -hmm. the English language. There's free as in beer, right? And <laughs> <laughs> like that you do not have to pay to use Wikipedia. Right. And then there's free as in speech, right? Which is okay. the notion that you can mix it, you can share it, you can disseminate it, you can change it, you can use it in different ways. And so we're firmly rooted in both of those. Wikipedia will always be free as in beer. People mm -hmm. can always use it. They don't have to pay a fee. They're not monetized in the ways that most web properties are. So we don't monetize the eyeballs. We don't have advertising. We don't sell information about the people They're who use it. They're not monitored either. No, that's right. And so, you know, some properties, um, their business model is predicated on the notion that they'll sell information about you to other entities, right? Either directly or, or, or in sort of mm -hmm. um, secondary ways. And we don't do that. We don't keep any information about the people who use Wikipedia. We don't sell it. There's no ad, ad clicking or, or no. um, any, uh, my name isn't going to appear someplace because I've, I've accessed Wikimedia. You're not collecting information. That's exactly right, yeah. Yeah, and the reason that there's no advertising on Wikipedia and our other projects is because we want to be used by teachers. Teachers are pretty conservative about advertising. They're pretty leery about commercialization of the classroom. Mm -hmm. And so our, our view is that there are lots of places on the internet that are ad supported, you know, Yelp and Google and so forth. There's all kinds of places and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's a, it's a classic right. business model, it makes perfect sense, right? But our view is that there should also be a place on the internet that is like a national park service, right? Mm -hmm. Like a place that's a public space that doesn't have any commercial imperative driving it. And so Wikipedia is very much that. In classic, it's funny, I was at the Aspen Institute recently and I was talking to John Carroll, who yes. used to be the editor mm -hmm. of the LA Times. Right, right, right. Um, and he was talking about, and the group that I was with was talking about um, the wall between church and state, right? Mm -hmm. Advertising and editorial and journalism and how it's always been a bit fraught and a bit complicated, right? Publishers have always tried to restrain themselves from bringing commercial pressure to bear upon the editorial side, or good publishers right. always did. Um, and they weren't always successful and it was always a bit of an uneasy relationship with a firewall, but the firewall that was often breached. And one of the things that's interesting about Wikipedia is it's a better 
mechanism to do that, right? So in journalism, you wanted to get information to people that was untainted by commercial interest, and it was very, very hard to do, and you often made mistakes, and there was a bit of a slippery slope, and sometimes you did do things that made your readers distrust you. Because so much of the funding was, was from a commercial source? Sure, like if you were like a tiny weekly newspaper, right. and your biggest advertiser was a local hotel, mm -hmm. you would be a little bit leery about writing something that could be perceived as critical of that hotel. It's, just, it's human nature, right? right. Um, and then that would happen on a bigger scale scale in bigger, in bigger media properties, right? And there's been obviously all kinds of examples of breaching of that wall and also um, of people just being nervous and being uncomfortable about it. And it can be, it can be a tricky path to walk, mm -hmm. right? What's interesting about Wikipedia is I think it solved that problem because it's written by 150,000 people all around the world. I am theoretically the publisher. So I do get people coming to me and wanting to influence the editorial content of Wikipedia, right? Ordinarily, it's people's own articles. So if there's an article about you, you might be a bit upset because you think it's unduly critical, right. or there's something in it that you think is, is trivial and shouldn't belong there, or whatever. So people come to me, and I know they come to Jimmy all the time, even more so than me. They come to us and they want their article revised or fixed or cleaned up or whatever. And there's nothing that Jimmy or I can do about it, which is really interesting. So the traditional lever was someone pressured the publisher. And then the publisher either held firm and was staunch and a good journalist or pressured their editorial hmm. people. They passed it on, right? I have no one to pass it on to. The Wikipedia editors are all around the world. I may or may not even know their names. I have no pressure I can bring to bear on them. I don't pay their salary. I have no way of influencing what they do, right? That would be terrible if they were irresponsible, bad people who didn't care about quality. But because they're incredibly earnest, serious-minded people who care a lot about quality, it's actually a really nice um, balance that redresses the old problem of publisher interference with editorial content. So the fact that we have no advertising, the fact that we have no commercial imperative, the fact that I have no control over the people who write the encyclopedia, all of that is good and all of that drives quality. So let's say uh, somebody ri writes an article about me and says that I'm blonde. Mm -hmm. Let's say I don't see myself as blonde. You're not blonde. I'm not blonde. <laughs> I don't think, okay, yes. So they, they, but, but they say that I'm blonde. What do I do to get that corrected? Historically, um, what you would have done is write an email to the Wikipedia volunteer team, mm -hmm. and they would take a look at it. They would try and find a photograph of you. They would try Send and a find a citation. Yeah, exactly. Um, historically, it was considered to be very, very bad form to edit your own article. Okay. And that's because people have a really hard time being unbiased about themselves, right? So you might think that the Harvard Fellowship that you won is the most important thing about you and should be celebrated from the rooftops. And in fact, the fact that you did something really terrible and weren't, was in prison for 30 years is actually more interesting, right? You so, found out about that. Yes. <laughs> so we have a hard time being unbiased about ourselves. It's human nature. So historically, because it's hard to be unbiased, it was thought to be in bad taste or bad mm -hmm. form to edit your own article. But I think that that is shifting a little bit because I think over time, Wikipedia editors, it's become obvious that no one is as expert in your life as you are. Mm -hmm. So for facts particularly, I think it's now considered more okay for you to edit. So if your birthday was wrong or where you went to school was wrong, I think now to go in and make that change yourself, as long as you can cite it, you can link it to something, right. is considered okay. So there'll be, uh, the, there will evolve some sort of a verification process for for facts over time. So, well, so you're not really static in how you're approaching uh, no. the whole editing process. No, not at all. No, it changes all the time. I mean, the fundamental is that everything needs to be cited, right? right. So that hasn't changed. So in fact, you wouldn't need your identity to be verified mm -hmm. because we wouldn't care who you were, right? If you were able to show us an article that said that your hair is brown, not blonde, and it was in an article that was authoritative, we would believe that that would be the proof, not the fact that you are you. Right. But one interesting challenge that that's raised over time for us is um, authoritative sourcing, right? What is an authoritative source? And that's a conversation that we're all having, the whole world is having with itself right now, right? So sometimes we find that blogs are more authoritative than one might imagine. And sometimes they're not, they're less authoritative, right? And so there's no easy answer anymore for what authority is, where credibility resides, all of that. 
So it's interesting watching, for me, watching the Wikipedia editors have their own conversations about what's an acceptable source and what isn't. I remember when I was in the newsroom at the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, we used to have conversations about Wikipedia itself, obviously. Was it okay to cite Wikipedia? Was it not okay? Wikipedia has become a lot more credible. Every year it becomes more credible, which just makes sense, right? It gets better and therefore people trust it more. It becomes higher quality over time, so people follow that and its credibility changes in the culture. But it's really interesting to watch that negotiation happen. And part of what I've seen happening there is a, an increased um, critical stance that I think people are taking towards traditional media and traditional sources of authority. So for example, um, you know, Wikipedia is criticized for sometimes being wrong, right? right? So sometimes it's wrong. And my response to that always is sometimes the New York Times is wrong, sometimes the BBC is wrong. There's an article on Wikipedia, I think it's one of our articles on global warming, um, which quotes a BBC backgrounder. The BBC does these terrific authoritative backgrounders, right. right, on the internet. And it links to that. And there's a mistake in that backgrounder. I don't remember what it is, but there's a mistake in it. And every now and then, somebody will change the Wikipedia article and cite it back to that error in the BBC article. Right. And so finally, a couple of the editors, after this happened six or seven times, a couple of the Wikipedia editors got together and decided to write the BBC and ask them to please change the mistake in their original article because it was infecting the Wikipedia because they were considered to be authoritative. I consider that so interesting, right? That, that, that Wikipedia is now, I think, starting to influence conventional media sources and starting to feed back um, into, into people's notions of credibility. What also strikes me is that the, the conversations that used to be reserved for, the, for uh, rooms of, of, of editors and journalists uh, yeah. for the newsroom is now, being, uh, now taking place. It's the same conversation, but it's a conversation that's now taking place in a, in a much broader community. No, and it's fascinating. I mean, it's fascinating for me. Um, the day I decided to go and work for the Wikimedia Foundation was the day of the Virginia Tech Massacre, so I think mm -hmm. that was April yes. of 07. I was offsite, I was at a conference, so I didn't have access to, you know, television or radio or whatever. I was only on the internet. And I was watching the story unfold, and I started on the New York Times and CBC's website and Associated Press and so forth. And I found myself over the course of the day drawn to the Wikipedia conversation. And, you know, you've, you've clicked on the, on the um, talk page, yes. the talk mm -hmm. Tab, yes, yeah, so you can watch the conversation evolve. Right. right. So I clicked on that and I followed the story on its talk page all day, and it was fascinating to me because I am sure it was exactly the conversation that the journalists who worked for me were having at home in the newsroom, right? It was like, you know, we heard three people are dead, but this source is saying four people are dead. Who is more credible? How do they know? Do they have someone on the site? How can we find out? What else do we know? How many shots were reported? It was a fascinating conversation, and it reminded me that. Journalism, you know, is a contested profession. It always has been, right? Um, and even the notion of is journalism a profession is really contested. When I graduated from journalism school in 1990, that may have been when journalism was at the peak of its authority, maybe 1980, 1990, right? right, right. right? It wasn't always considered um, to be, uh, uh, well, to be a profession, to be something that you know um, was respectable, even right. It was a working class job. You didn't necessarily go to school. You worked your way up out of the copy room or right. whatever, right? And obviously, there have also been lots of times in journalistic history where journalists were scribes to power of various mm -hmm. kinds, and they didn't have objectivity. They didn't have um, any kind of professional distance from what they were doing. So we were always told in journalism school and when I was a young journalist that all a journalist really needed was a reasonable amount of intelligence and curiosity about the world around them. And I saw that on the day of Virginia Tech, I saw that in the Wikipedia editors. They were just being sensible, smart, thoughtful, responsible human beings. It's not brain surgery journalism, right? It is. It's right. just curiosity and skepticism, and they had that. And so they did a terrific job, as good as anybody else on that day, I think. So are we becoming the fourth estate? Yeah, exactly. Are, is all of us becoming yeah. the fourth estate? The yeah. check on power? Yeah, and what's interesting about it is that it was in my view, um, it was given to a special class, a special group of people mm -hmm. because of the, the impediments to, to, to creating journalism, right? 
So, you know, if you didn't own a press, what, what was that line? Um, the person who owns the press. Oh, the, writes you know, the news. The yeah, person it who was owns the press writes the news. Exactly, and it was expensive. It was expensive to publish. It was expensive to disseminate news and so forth. And those were artificial constraints. They weren't real world. They were, they were constraints of the time, right? Now those constraints have gone away, which means that anybody can publish, anybody can research, credibility will, f will, will accrue to people who earn it and people who deserve it. Mm -hmm. And that's a, better, that's a better place for us to be as a culture. I think people today have more access to information than they ever had before. Not everyone has access, but the vast majority of people have increased access relative to ever before. And I think they have a voice today that they also never had before, right? It was very, it was expensive, it was hard, it took a lot of time, blah, 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 to develop a voice. And now people have it, and I think it's a better world. I'm very optimistic, I'm very, I'm very excited about the direction that things are going. You know, I, I find it really interesting, the, the whole notion of free, and what free means. You, you parsed free into a couple of different areas. One was free access. Mm -hmm. Now it seems also that we have a lot of free access to a lot of other sources. Uh, there are the search engines, Google, mm -hmm. uh, Yahoo, now Bing. Um, that's free, isn't it? Uh, mm -hmm. We have Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, we have Facebook, where people are exchanging information, and that's expanding. Um, even uh, some of the journalistic enterprises, one can access the New York Times online for free. Mm -hmm. um, are these, these commercial organizations, are they free? Are they not free? Is there, is there really a difference uh, in terms of, of the quality of, of information that a uh, Wikimedia um, provides? Um, yeah. what, is, what, what is free? It's really really interesting. Um, so for example, Twitter. Uh, the other night my cell phone stopped working. I stopped receiving data on my cell phone and I went to Twitter and searched for Verizon and data outage or something and there was a guy on Twitter saying my cell phone's not working. I don't have any data service. What's going on, right? That was good enough for me. That was journalism to me, right? I didn't need to have that um, officially endorsed by anybody. I didn't need it to appear in the San Francisco Chronicle. I didn't even really need it to be correct. I just needed someone to sort of tip me off that it was a bigger problem than my own phone. I right. shouldn't spend the night troubleshooting my phone, right? So we have different level, in my view, we have different level of quality need for mm -hmm. different kinds of information. So on Facebook, no one is double sourcing the fact right. that it's my brother's birthday, you know, blah, 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 right? We, so we have different levels for quality, for, for requirements for quality. Um, so some organizations, some institutions are simply providing a platform and what people do with it is up to them, right? So individuals on that platform will accrue the credibility that they earn, right? Mm -hmm. And some of them will become breakout superstars that other people will follow. Some of them, their brothers and sisters will follow them and that's right. fine, et cetera, right? Um, where Wikipedia is different from most of those other endeavors is that Wikipedia is, in, is attempting to create something that is, and, and again, we use this word and we hate this word, but product, right? We're attempting to create a product that is bigger it, than just a pass-through of information, right? So it's not ephemera, it doesn't wash over you. It's not actually intended to be news, although increasingly it has news-like attributes, right? But Wikipedia is an attempt to create an aggregation of all information, all human knowledge, right? Brought together and shaped and refined by different people over time. So it's intended to be a, a monument, a thing, right? An, an institution, a book, a product. Um, that is more than the sum of its parts. So I think what is different about Wikipedia is that it, it, is, it is an accretion, an accumulation that is more than the sum of its parts, right? And again, it can be taken and used by other people in other contexts, right? So just today, um, a product was launched called the Wiki Reader, mm -hmm. which is a little tiny device. It's $100 on Amazon, and you can carry it around, and it's Wikipedia. It's, 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 it's dumb. It's not connected to the Internet. It's just an offline version of Wikipedia, which you can update every day or every so month. So instead of the encyclopedia sets, you can actually Yeah, you get just this. have a little box, right? It's and what's cool. terrific about that, I mean, I mean, we think it's great, right? And, and it, it's being positioned, I think, as something that might be useful, for example, for older people who don't have a smartphone, but they want access. It's a really simple device. It's a nice small device. But the real value of a device like that is we want people um, imagining ways to use the content in Wikipedia in other contexts, right? 
there's a guy um, in, uh, gosh, where is he? Nairobi, I think, who um, takes Wikipedia to schools on USB sticks, I think, or something like that, and, and installs it in schools, right? We want people who don't have connections to the internet or easy connections to the internet to have the ability to access Wikipedia and the other projects. So materials. people in rural, in, in rural Africa mm -hmm. can actually, as long as they have a, a computer, they could actually dis, uh, disconnect it from the internet, still access uh, Yeah, I mean, Wikipedia. there's a number of ways that that can be done, right? You can, you know, you can get it on a USB mm -hmm. stick. You can get it on this wiki reader device. You can, um, it's on one laptop per child, for example. There's a version of Wikipedia on one laptop per child. There's a new feature on the English and German Wikipedias, which is the ability to create a book for yourself. You can take any article or uh, different articles and collect them together and have a book printed for you, I think, in Texas. So you could actually create a, through Wikimedia, if you wanted to teach a, a, a course on the Civil War, or if you wanted to, to teach a course on the Green Revolution and its offshoots mm -hmm. in, in uh, developing countries, you could actually create a, a yep. textbook yep. or a book? Yep, you could pull together different articles, you could put them in whatever order you wanted, you could put other pref preface material, things like that. It obviously has a million different possible uses, right? You could give your mother a book on the Beatles for Christmas if she were a huge Beatles fan. You know, you could create a book about the breed of dog that you own. You could do anything with it. Um, and we encourage that and we want that to happen. The more people can engage with the content, the more they can pull it out of Wikipedia in different forms, use it in multiple places, use it for multiple purposes. That's what it's for, right?